Now, quickly, you could say, well, why, why is there not more, uh, why isn't there better statistical work on this? One reason is that urban developers have not been interested in looking at amenities and trying to study what causes urban growth in general. Um, and the people who have been interested in amenities have t t tended to be people who are anthropologists uh, or cultural sociologists, and they have not been interested in urban development. So these two disciplines have not talked to each other very much. In addition, the cultural sector has, has not been interested in thinking about uh, culture in a city in a way that's larger than just looking at the ballet company or the opera house. People who are interested in culture and the arts have tended to say, we don't need to look at, 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 the, at Starbucks. We don't need to look at uh, coffee shops or bookstores. We just need to look at the high arts. And so they haven't gathered the evidence either. Uh, 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 and, uh, so, so these are all these are all problems. Um, so the the effect of this is that uh, the data that we've been trying to look for has been located all over the place. It's been very hard to get uh, to get research going in this area because you have to you have to gather information that's not normally gathered by the government in a way that makes it easy for you to study. How do you find out where the opera houses are located? There, that's in one basket. How do you find out where the, where the Starbucks are located? That's in another database. database. So you have some hard work to do to try to bring these things together. Okay. Um, the result is that the research has remained um, really a matter of uh, people using stories instead of evidence. They're not basing what they're doing on hard Hard evidence, and that means that the policies that have resulted in the United States, many, 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 many cities around the country, uh, the U.S. have started have started to put in Starbucks or put in, uh, uh, as I said, put in bicycle paths. But uh, that, and and they believe they have faith that this is going to make college graduates stay or or come to their cities. But there's no evidence that it will. Right? Um, Okay, so our solution was, uh, in the project, was first to get a database together that would be national, that would include all sorts of variables, and would be, um, uh, would, would, would include as much information as possible about what is actually out there in, in the city. If you walk around on the street, what do you see? What are, the, what are, what are all the different businesses that, that, um, that appeal to you when, you when you walk around in a neighborhood? Yeah, so we, we got uh, many different sources of data. I don't need to spend much time on this for you. But one of the things we were able to do was to um, actually um, count the number of uh, pizza restaurants here, uh, the number of churches. Back, we can tell different religious uh, groups, uh, dance companies, nightclubs. Uh, so we, 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 we're including many, many different kinds of things in, in, in these databases. Um, so then one of the things you can do is you can ask questions about different cities and, and you can say, how many bowling alleys are, you know, do people know what bowling is in China? Yeah. You know, it's a bowling? Yeah. So, so you, you can look here on this uh, purple thing, it shows this, this is Chicago. Chicago has many more bowling alleys than uh, New York does and many more than Berkeley, California does. Yeah? Um, whereas uh, if you look at the number of um, of bookstores, uh, which is this, this here, yeah, this this city here, which is L.A., Los Angeles has a, a big lead in the number of bookstores. So this is one way of making uh, a visible what what we you know what's present in the different cities. But it only helps you uh, a little bit because all you're doing is counting absolute numbers. Uh, we know that Chicago has. Uh, has more business and professional associations. We know New York City has more foundations, and so forth. So uh, we've got some 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 information, but it's not very usable because how do you analyze that? But one one of the problems is if you're trying to figure out why somebody decides to move somewhere, they're not going to decide to move to a city because there happens to be a bowling alley there, <laughs> right? They're going to make the decision based on all the uh, uh, looking at around them and sort of. Uh, combining what they see and saying, oh, this is a place I would like to live because it has this whole uh, array of things, yes? So you can't just count the numbers. 
uh, of things and think that you understand what what is drawing what, what a city is like. You have to have some more robust way of, of measuring it. So how do you get these differences? How do you tell the differences uh, between tattoo parlors, for example, and museums? Well, I mean, we know that a tattoo parlor is is attractive to some people. The, the tattoos, yeah. Okay, so we know a tattoo parlor is attractive to some people and. Probably not the same person who likes tattoo parlors, likes museums. Uh, but um, we also you know, know that people who like opera don't usually often like, n not always like jazz, right? So you think, you can't just say, well, I want to invest in the arts. Uh, you need to figure out what arts you should invest in and how those arts should be related to the things like tattoo parlors that you also, your city also should be thinking about when it's trying to decide what to do. Okay, so there's also some other problem is that, that it, when I go, if, if I like tattoo parlors, I might like them for more than one reason. Or I might like them for a reason that's different from why you like them. I might like them because I like to go into scary places. I like to be scared. And you might like them because you like to show off how, how brave you are, you know, that you can take the pain, right? Mm -hmm. so, so a tattoo parlor can mean more than one thing Yes, and, 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 and so if you're going to try to study it, you need to take account of the things that it can mean if you want to figure out why it would be attractive to somebody. So how can we define these qualities? Uh, and then how can we talk about all the different businesses that are in a, in a city or a neighborhood together? How can we add all this up in a way that will be true to what, what we actually experience when we're uh, in a neighborhood? And the answer is to try to think about what a scene is. This is where the, I, the name scene comes in. A scene is, the, it, it is what, you, what you see all around you when you walk around in a neighborhood. Everything that's there, right? the whole landscape around you, the cultural landscape that you experience. Right? So what are scenes, where are they, and what do they do are the three questions that we have to ask. People who talk about scenes, there's a, there's a tradition uh, among cultural sociologists of talking about scenes in, uh, as a collection of people uh, and activities that involves culture. So people talk about the blues scene in Chicago. Uh, so it's a scene around a particular art practice. Um, or they talk about the theater scene uh, or, the, or the movie scene. Right? Uh, it, uh, and people who are interested in the movies they tend to go to the same places, talk about the movies together, and so forth, right? Um, they also talk about things like the beach scene in certain places. So what is it that you, what is it about the beach scene that makes it a scene? Well, you go to the beach, because, not just because you want to lie down in the sun, but you want to go to a beach because there are other people at the beach who are also lying down, but then some of them are weightlifting, and you, want, you like to watch them weight lift, or you like to run along the beach, and you, you like to see other people running along the beach. So there are a lot of things happening at a beach that make it into a scene. Simply having a beach is not the same thing as having a beach scene. Right? So you need to think about what makes a beach scene different from just a beach. And then they also talk about neighborhood scenes. So I assume there are neighborhoods in Jinan that you guys go to at night. Are there, are there, are there, are there particular uh, places in, in Jinan that people go dancing or... Tenton Square. Tenton Square? <laughs> or they go to the spring, I suppose, yeah. Spring <laughs> Park. Yeah, the spring, okay. So, uh, but, but places where people uh, come together socially in, in public uh, to, to, uh, uh, to share cultural experience with each other, yes? Um, uh, there, there, there are, is a tradition in cultural studies research uh, in the United States and in, in Europe of talking about scenes in the city as being a substitute for, for older forms of social relationship that uh, we're, we've, we've abandoned when, since we moved to the city. We've lost those older ties uh, to family and to community, and instead we, we have these voluntary relationships with others that we, uh, we uh, create uh, freely, uh, where we can we can come and go. We're not required to go to these things, uh, and yet uh, they give us something that we've lost uh, when we moved away from the village. So the urban village 
is, uh, is, is another way of thinking about a scene as a, as a kind of urban uh, village, a substitute for the sense of community that you used to have. Um, uh, cultural sociologists also talk about subcultures as being uh, 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 forms of community that are, that are different from mass culture uh, and, and that give people a sense of being uh, with, each, with each other and identifying with each other as being part of a group that's different from the, from the, the world at, at large. And so that's another way of thinking about scenes as connected to subcultures, except again, in, this, in, in subcultures it's often the case that you're, you're, you're setting yourself off against other people uh, in a negative way, whereas with a scene it's just a matter of something that you like to do. So there's not, uh, there's not this kind of negative relationship um, to, the, to the world at, at large. Um, one can take a more philosophical uh, perspective on scenes and say, scenes are simply practices of meaning making through, through shared consumption. So, uh, for example, you can be a writer, and, and the philosopher Sartre talks about being a writer, and he says, being a writer uh, in New York is, uh, it, you can be a writer in New York or a writer in Paris. If you're a writer in New York, you will go in, you will sit in your apartment and you will write your great American novel. And you, will ne you never come out of your apartment. You'll call out for Chinese food. Uh, 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 but you'll never come out, you'll not, you not spend your time meeting other writers. But if you're a writer in Paris, you will sit in the cafe. Right? And you will write while you're in the cafe. And you'll write a paragraph and then you'll look up and you'll see somebody and they'll make you think of something else and then you'll write something. And this is the way Sartre worked, right? So, so he, he was, he said in Paris there is a writing scene, yes? Because it's a social relationship, the activity. Um, you can think of the square dancing in Beijing, Wang Shang Wu as uh, being a, a similar kind of thing, sort of people getting together to do something uh, in public. I hope I pronounced that right. Did I talk? I'm trying. Okay. So, uh, so another way of saying this is that scenes are uh, uh, specific form of cultural action when, that uh, is different from the kind of action that's involved in, in uh, taking care of the necessities of life or different from uh, the action that's involved when you're trying to do a job and produce a product. In a scene, what you're there for is the experience itself. You're not trying to produce a product and, you're, and, and you could live without it. You, you wouldn't die if you didn't have it. Right? So, so it's a, a distinctive area of, uh, of social activity. The aims uh, of, of scenes we can describe as three, uh, three fundamentally uh, different kinds of purposes that are fulfilled by participating in scenes with other people. First, there's, there are scenes that are aimed at uh, valuing identity and valuing being, valuing being connected to, to, uh, to something larger than oneself. Uh, a second, a second uh, aim is, whoops, Second aim is, is to, uh, 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 to value the appearance of oneself to other people, to, to the, 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 the making visible of oneself to other people, and to watching other people, seeing other people and being seen. And last but not least, scenes can be about, about being moved, being, uh, feeling committed to something as a result of participating or in the process of participating. And I'm, I'm going to try to unpack what these mean in, in more uh, uh, more uh, detail. So uh, we, when we work on this, we can translate these three fundamental aims into three different kinds of scene, uh, uh, three, ki three kinds of value that are associated with scenes. One, one area of value is what we would call theatricality. And that is to say, uh, you can, there are, there are certain, thing, certain kinds of scenes that are designed primarily to allow you to enjoy watch, seeing other people and, uh, and, and to enjoy being seen by other people. So parades would be a good example of this. People love to go to a parade, and sometimes you like to participate in a parade. People, you watch people in the parade, and they watch you, and they wave to you, and so forth, right? And that's, that is fun. But that's very different from a scene that is designed to uh, provide you with a sense of an authentic uh, experience, the real thing. That, uh, that uh, you know. So, so if you want, you may go to a, you may go to a university because you want to be in a place where people are interested in truth, in the real truth about things. 
uh, and uh, uh, and that that would, that that would be a different reason than going to a university is to hang out with other people uh, who you think are cool and you like their their appearance. Yes. Last but not least, there's there's this cultural experiences that tend to be designed to make you feel that you're uh, doing the right thing while you're doing it, that you're engaged in something, uh, some kind of um, uh, um, movement, right? Either one in which you're, you're being moved, uh, pulled along by the by, by by the action in the scene, or one in which you feel that you're you're accomplishing something beyond just the moment in participating in the scene. Okay, so let me quickly unpack these. Um, Theatricality, uh, let me, some, some examples of theatricality. So, um, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're going to the film festival in Cannes, you're standing on the red carpet, uh, and, and, and you're watching the stars get out of the, uh, the limousine, you're, you're, you're clearly enjoying watching them get out of the limousine. Uh, but you could also go to a, uh, uh, a show in which uh, a performance artist uh, takes out a, a, a needle and, and sticks it through their arm. That happens sometimes, right? It does something horrifying, uh, and, and you enjoy that too. And that's a very different kind of pleasure from watching the watching uh, uh, Charlize Theron get out of the uh, the limousine. Yeah, but but they're all about they're both about watching uh, something. Or you could go to a school play and enjoy watching your child perform and watching other children perform. Th those are those are also theatrical pleasures, yeah? Or last but not least, you might, you might be a, uh, go to a party where everybody's dancing, and you're, uh, part of the party's fun is that people take turns jumping up on the table and dancing in front of other people. I don't know if that happens in China, but it does a lot in the United States, right? And each of these is a very different kind of experience. So, so you could say one, one kind of theatrical experience is involved with shocking and breaking the rules, yes? So tattoo parlors, as I said before, um, or, or modern dance performances are, are about watching people do something that they shouldn't be doing with their body normally, right? Uh, and, and, and you enjoy that, so, so it's a theatrical pleasure, yeah? That's very different from the value that's, uh, that you get out of um, uh, going to the opera or, uh, and watching somebody um, show off how, how well they can sing or, or going to... Um, uh, 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 a hair salon, you know, and, and, and watching somebody get, get a, a great hairdo, yes? That's, that's not, you don't, you don't expect to be shocked when, you, when, they, when they come out of the, out of the hairdressers. You expect them to look good, yeah? Uh, and and there, people are going to the hairdressers because they want to look good. They want to show off for you. So exhibitionism is, is what we would call that. Then there's another kind of tra uh, uh, theatricality that's associated with glamorousness, right? Instead of showing off, uh, to be glamour to be glamorous means to uh, to 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 uh, act as if nobody knows, act as if you don't know that you're being watched, right? So the movie star does not acknowledge the crowd, yes, and the crowd likes that the movie star does not acknowledge the crowd. And when the movie star does acknowledge the crowd, it's from a, dis a distance. So it's it's a it's different a different relationship, uh, and it's one that makes that, that some people seek out. If a movie star was actually you know trying to get the crowd to look at him or her, then that would not be as much that, that would not be a glamorous experience anymore, right? You would say the movie star is showing off; they're trying to be exhibitionists, and then you might not like it, or you might like it, but it would it would not be glamour anymore, yeah. So we're, we're trying to make these distinctions. Mm -hmm. huh? Okay, so um, last but not least, there's this kind of formality. That is to say, a lot of people enjoy going to, uh, being in a scene where, where, where you know that other people are all gonna behave themselves in the same way. Yes, so everybody follows the same rule, everybody dresses up, and, and it's really nice when you go to, uh, to, the, to the symphony and everybody's dressed you know, in an appropriate way, yeah? And if, they, if people don't dress in the right way, it can ruin your evening for you. You expect it and you want it to be. So that's part of what makes the scene uh, fun, yeah? Uh, now, this doesn't have to be necessarily stodgy or conservative. There are formal scenes that are very um, scary also. Like, so if you go to a biker bar, 
Do, do they have biker bars? Or uh, motorcycle gang, motorcycle gang bars? You know, where, where people dress in leather, leather outfits and, no? Okay, so. Hmm? A gay club? <laughs> okay, so some, you know, you know, yeah, clubs that are that are where people are are, are in a ritual of mating of a certain kind, right? Uh, and they have to dress in a certain way, because everybody's dressing the same way. It's like being at the opera in that sense, but it's very different in other ways. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last but not least is his neighborly. Uh, there's certainly uh, a theatrical neighborliness. That is, to say, there are some experiences where what you like to do is you like to see and be seen. Um, uh, uh, communicating in a, in a friendly, personal way. It's not glamorous. You're not trying to show off. You're not trying to shock anybody. You're trying to uh, uh, be together with them and just hang out with them and, and share, uh, share uh, information about, your, about each other and have a nice chat, yes? So that, that would, you, you, your relationship to them is, is neighborly, not glamorous. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the other two dimensions, so I'm going to go really quickly through these. But so I talked about theatricality. Authenticity is a very different kind of uh, thing that you can seek from from a cultural experience. You can, uh, you know, try to try to um, uh, look for experiences that you think are uh, are 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 are, uh, are real. Uh, does there, is there a word for authenticity in Chinese? Well, you're talking about, about how there used to be, there, people used to trust the merchants, right? And there used to be a real spirit, yeah? So what would, what would the word for spirit be? Uh, the only thing I can think of is that like, Sichuan food has numbing peppers. If you were at a Sichuan restaurant and they didn't have numbing peppers, then it wouldn't be authentic. Ah, yeah, so, so, yeah, so it, it, I don't know if you could hear, but Sichuan food has to have, it has to have those peppers, numbing peppers, yeah, that you bite and you numbs your mouth, yeah. If, if, you, if you go to a Sichuan restaurant and it doesn't have those peppers, you would say that's not an authentic Sichuan restaurant, right? More like <laughs> okay. So, so there is such a, a concept here. But folk music, you know, uh, folk folk music. Uh, I assume that there's such a thing as folk music in China. China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that that would be what the authentic Chinese music. Yeah. So authenticity is often related to, uh, uh, well, it can be related to the sense that you can only get this thing here. Yeah. Only here can you find this thing. Um, hmm? Okay. So that's one thing, and then, but that there's also an, uh, an authenticity that's related to the. Uh, the sense that th this thing is associated only with this group of people. You can only get this thing from this group of people. And it doesn't matter where the people are, but uh, it has to be that particular group of people who carry the authenticity. So in the United States, if you want to hear the blues, which is a, a folk music played by black people, yeah, from the South originally, um, it's old music, uh, uh, the best blues players in the world now are Japanese in terms of how well they play. But they cannot get a job in, a, in the United States. You cannot, they, they will never get hired. Because people go to the blues club because they, they want to see black people play the blues. <laughs> so uh, it's associated with blackness. It's not associated with the, with the music itself. The authenticity is what people are seeking, yeah? OK. Um, th uh, there are other kinds of authenticity I'm going to sort of leave aside for now. Uh, but just to say there are. And then the third dimension, really quickly, is um, this notion of legitimacy or of authority. So this is, a, we're, here we're trying to get at, at what happens when you, when, you tr when you attend a show, a music show, uh, let's say a performance of your favorite artist. Who's your favorite musician? There's somebody that, when you listen to them, you, you feel that they're talking directly to you and that they're going to change your life and you would follow them anywhere. Yes? How, I mean, there must be, they have charisma, we say. That's the word in English. Is there a good? Uh, Mei Li. Mei Li? Oh, no. Charisma is, uh, literally means Mei Li in Chinese. Oh. Yeah. 
that. So, so that that's uh, charisma is one particular kind of uh, of, uh, of legitimacy, but there are other kinds as well. So uh, one kind, another kind is uh, traditionalism. So you could say uh, you you would want to go to the uh, the what is it the fountain uh, the, the, the the spring here because it's associated with um, a tradition that uh, 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 older writers used to go there and so forth. So that when you go, you go to the spring in order to get in touch with that tradition, and you feel it's the right thing to get in touch with that tradition at the springs of Jinan. Yeah. Um, history museums would be would be important places where you'd go for this. Um, in the United States, there are people who who spend their weekends dressing up in uh, civil in, in the uniforms of our Civil War, which was hundred years ago, and they, they pretend to be doing the war, and they, they spend their whole lives doing this. It's, a, it's very important to them, because it connects them with the history. Yeah? Um, it's also possible to say um, what you enjoy about the, the cultural experience is that you feel like you're getting something done. And this is different from feeling charisma. It's you, 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 what you want, what you enjoy is uh, you like to go to parks because you like to be able to jog, and you feel good when you're jogging because you feel like you're making yourself healthier. Yeah? Whether you are or not, it doesn't matter, but you feel that you are, right? So science museums or ballet classes uh, that uh, uh, would, would go for this as well. And then, of course, the, most, the, the, the form of a scene that's most associated with the arts is the idea that you, you participate in a scene because you, uh, you enjoy self-expression. You enjoy people um, uh, making something that, they, that you've never experienced before, the creative moment. So you go, you go to a jazz show because you, want to, you, you expect somebody to play something that you've never heard before, yeah? something innovative. Um, you go to a, a comedy club for the same, same reason. Um, whoops. Okay. And then there's also egalitarianism. So, so um, I know I've been rushing through this, but the point I was trying to make is that there are 15 different kinds of pleasure that you can say are associated with, with uh, cultural experience. So um, there, there are these different kinds of legitimacy, different kinds of theatricality, and different kinds of authenticity. And it's important to say, to, to know that these are different from each other, because if you, don't, if you don't think about them being different, you might make a mistake in your policies by trying to put something in that you think is going to give uh, signal one kind of uh, cultural experience, but actually doesn't do that, and then people will not respond to the signals. Right? But not everybody likes all these things. Everybody will like some of these things, uh, and other people will like others. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so the point here is that different amenities will be stronger in, in one or another of these areas. So if you take, for example, a studio that specializes in body piercings, like you, know, you want to get a, your tongue pierced, do they do that in China? No. Some people do, right? So there are studios where you can go and get your tongue, uh, put a, get your tongue pierced, or your 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 nose pierced, or your, your <laughs> head, right? Any part of your body that you want, and, and and these things would be very high in transgression, right? Because it's breaking the rules to get yourself pierced, right? and you're you're a bad person to do that. Uh, it's 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 very anti-traditional, uh, and it's certainly not something that the corporate world would, would look highly on. Right. Okay. So, um, what we were then able to do was to we, we we now we can say we know what what the components of a scene can be. How can we make this into a tool for for public policy? How can we make this understanding of a scene into a uh, an analytic instrument to allow us to measure where scenes are and then ask well whether they make a difference or not? So what we were what this is what we did. We started by taking um, all uh, taking our business census, which is the government collects the, the statistics on where how many businesses there are in every zip code in every area in the country. Yes, and uh, we 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 looked through the categories of businesses, and we selected all the businesses that we thought were cultural in some way or another. So that that included a lot of things that we would normally think of as culture, but it also included things like boutiques. Um, uh, used bookstores, uh, different kinds of restaurants, and so forth, right? So a very wide net. 
And then we rank each of these categories for every one of those different dimensions that I talked about earlier. So, you know, we, we gave a score for how uh, important is, is tradition, how important is expressive individualism, how important is uh, charisma to, uh, to the opera, to, the, to, to popular music, to the fashion show, to the body piercing, yeah? So for each of these categories, we, we, we gave a rank, yes? And then we were able to, we could, we could score all the businesses in, in a given area on all of these different dimensions, and then add them all up. So then you would know what, what is the total score for tradition in this area, yes? So what did we find? One thing we found was that if you look at different regions in the United States, if you say uh, the Northeast is part of the, one part of the United States, the South is another part of the United States, and you add up all the businesses in those regions, and you and you say, well, what is it? What are the dimensions in, that are, are are important in the Northeast? It turns out that different regions have different scenes, and that's what you you would expect to find. Because you know that Shanghai is different from, uh, you know the south of China is different from the north of China. And, I, and people are doing the same research now in China, by the way. So uh, uh, there are some statistics coming into this. But so you can see, for example, in this slide that um, uh, uh, the, you know, it's the, the, these, these are the different dimensions. So transgression is, is, is higher in the west than it is in the other two regions. Yeah, this gives you a sense that this this instrument is making is showing us that things are very different in different places at the regional level. We look also at the city level, compare one city to another city, and you find that in fact, Los we we in Chicago. I'm from Chicago. We are competing with New York and Los Angeles. We know that. We we know that college graduates who want to move to a big city are choosing between Chicago and, and Los Angeles and New York. So it's important to know what we have that they don't have and what they have uh, that, uh, that we don't have. And it turns out that Los Angeles has a lot of self-expressive uh, possibilities for people. So if, you want, if you're the kind of person who likes self-expression, you're probably going to want to go to Los Angeles. Uh, if you want, if you if you're the kind of person who is really interested in getting things done for yourself, even in your free time and your leisure time, you'll go go to New York. Yeah. The most interesting things, though, are at the level of the neighborhood because neighborhoods within a city are very different. And I said I was asking you before, was there a neighborhood here in Jinan that you go to? I'm sure there's more than one neighborhood. And there are some neighborhoods that you like, and for some reasons, and others for others. In Chicago, we live. Our university is located in a place called Hyde Park, and Hyde Park is a very beautiful neighborhood. It's got more bookstores uh, than any other neighborhood in the world, probably. Um, and uh, but it doesn't have very many tattoo parlors or or music clubs. In fact, it has no music clubs. And so uh, if, if you compare our neighborhood with another neighborhood in Chicago that everybody wants to move to when they get out of college, it's called Wicker Park. There was actually a movie made about it um, with the title Wicker Park. You, you can see that every place where they're high, we're low, right? They're high, we're low. Where we're high, they're low. So they're the opposite of us. Our neighborhood is the anti-Wicker Park. Now, uh, uh, our pre the president of our university has wanted to try to make our neighborhood more attractive to college graduates. So when I show this slide to him, he's not very happy. Because uh, what this slide means is that it's going to be very hard for us to compete. Because we would have to turn ourselves inside out. We'd have to, we'd have to, you know, get, uh, we'd have to uh, turn ourselves upside down in order to be like with the report. So, the big question though is, does this, do we, should we care about scenes if we care about the future of our cities? If you care about the future of Jinan, should you care about whether, whether your city creates an interesting cultural scene or not? 
one of the things that having this information allows us to do is to, um, to, to, to analyze the, the, the kinds of things that urban uh, uh, researchers are interested in, but including measures of scenes in the ver as one of the variables that you need to, to test against to see whether it makes any difference whether a scene uh, of a certain kind is present in a city. Does it make any difference to crime if a city has, uh, or a neighborhood has a particular kind of scene? Do certain kinds of scenes reduce crime? Do certain kinds of scenes uh, lead to an increase in, uh, in, the, in the real estate prices in a neighborhood? Do they lead to an increase in, um, uh, in safety? There are all, all sorts of things that people are interested in that have nothing to do with culture, but culture might make a difference. So uh, now we have a way of, of, uh, of assessing whether culture makes a difference because we can say, this is the culture of this place. And we, can, we have many different uh, cases to look at. We have 42,000 zip codes in the United States. Those are regional, those are little areas, like 10 block areas. And so we can compare many different areas and, and, and do this kind of work. So one of the things we found out we looked at um, neighborhoods that are defined as bohemian neighborhoods. That these are neighborhoods that are high in transgression, uh, low in, in in other in, in other uh, others of these uh, other uh, other categories. Uh, and it's a term that uh, Richard Florida and others have used. And it comes out of 19th century um, 19th century France. Uh, has anybody uh, uh, scenes from the the life of Bohemia is a famous French, French uh, uh, La Boheme, the, the opera is set in, in, a, in Paris. So, so Bohemia has long been a kind of a word for the kind of place that college graduates think is cool, the, a place that college graduates would like to, like to go and live in because there's a lot of music there and there's a lot of um, freedom. Uh, people are, are just doing what they want to do and so forth, right? Um, uh, uh, so, Richard Florida's claim was that college graduates always want to move to these neighborhoods. So what we, we did was we looked at Chicago and we looked at LA and we looked at New York and we asked, well, are college graduates moving to these neighborhoods in LA? Are college graduates moving to bohemian neighborhoods in New York? Are college graduates moving to bohemian neighborhoods in Chicago? And it turns out college graduates from New York are different from college graduates in, from Chicago. College graduates in New York uh, are, are moving away from Bohemian neighborhoods. And the same thing is true uh, in LA. That is said, in Los Angeles, if you graduate from college, this is not what people expect. They're move, the students are moving away from these neighborhoods. In Chicago, they're moving towards them. What does that tell us? That tells us that not all college graduates are the same. Okay? So if you want to compete for college graduates, you might want to and you're in Genoa, you might want to think, well, what are the college graduates here like? Not what college graduates in some abstract way are like. I assume that you guys are different from, from people who are in college in, in, in Beijing in some ways. Okay. Maybe not, but I mean, that would be worth, worth checking if you're trying to figure out what's gonna happen. Okay, um, let, me, let me slide by that. Another thing we found out is that, um, again, uh, uh, in, in different cities, there are very different responses to the kind of, you know, people are moving to, move, not moving to the same kind of neighborhoods uh, that you would expect if you thought that there was a one size fits all um, uh, view of what, you know, what, what kinds of things uh, individuals wanted. So there seems to be the case that if you, if you go to school in a certain region, you're gonna, you're gonna develop certain tastes that are different from the tastes of, of students who go to school in another region. That's an odd thing to, to know, but it's important. Um, the same thing is true for work, and I'm not gonna spend any more time talking about it. So let me, let me quickly um, conclude by, <clears throat> by saying uh, a couple of things about the implications of this. Because I, uh, I assume that you want, uh, some of you want to try to improve life uh, around the campus uh, in the neighborhoods here in Janine, but Janine and some of you want to uh, help uh, go into policy uh, 
uh, public policy and urban development uh, thinking uh, that will help other cities around China uh, to, uh, to make the right choices going forward. So, uh, uh, and and it, I think it's the case that in China it's increasingly going to be uh, important for mayors to, to be thinking about amenities uh, as they're trying to decide how they want their city to look in the future. What, they, what should they invest in? And how should they, how should they try to um, uh, develop scenes within their own cities? Right? So one, one, one lesson here is that if, if you want to preserve, if you have a scene that's already there, but you want to make it more uh, uh, bigger, you, you, you have to be very careful what you, what you add in, because you may destroy the thing that you're, that you're, that you're trying to, uh, to help. You have to be very careful about adding additional uh, elements to a scene that already exists. Right? You need to do that carefully and think about what, what you want to bring in and how will it be read by people, how will it be interpreted by people who already like the, the way the thing is now. Yeah? Um, uh, another lesson is that you, you need to, um, to ask whether uh, and you can do this with the, with the data that we have. You can do it for Chinese uh, neighborhoods too, I think. You can, you can, you can ask whether the, the, the scene that you would like to produce really would make a difference to the kinds of things that you're trying to affect socially. Or if you're trying to change, if you're trying to bring more money into the city, you might want to pursue a particular kind of policy with regard to scene. If you're trying to use a scene to reduce tension, social tension, um, or maybe reduce crime rates, um, you, that you might uh, pursue a different kind of scene. Um, okay. Um, so again, the, 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 the take-home lesson is don't, don't just say, I want to make a lively place here. Let me put, I know what a lively place is. Let me, let me get an arts organization and move them into this neighborhood. Don't think you know. Don't think you can start from from a zero uh, level. There is always going to be something there already, and it's best to build up from what you've got. So you need to figure out what your assets are, what you have to work with, and then try to grow from organically from what you have um, uh, there. Okay. And and last but not least, you should be able to think about scenes not just in order to attract college graduates. But you might want to think about whether or not there are other things that you could do with them that would be, uh, you know, of use to poor people, for example, uh, that don't don't have to do with getting college graduates to move there, but may have to do with helping poor people who have a certain kind of culture turn that into an asset that they can they can make um, uh, uh, attractive to the rest of the the rest of the world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.